Hello, my name is True Tamplin, and I'm a student at the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Today I'm going to be talking about a kind of funny topic. It's, it's called how to make decisions, life decisions, uh, using a calculator. And to, to start off this conversation, I'm actually going to open it up with a quotation from Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, and it goes like this. Survival machines that can simulate the future are one jump ahead of survival machines who can only learn on the basis of overt trial and error. The trouble with overt trial is that it takes time and energy. The trouble with overt error is that it is often fatal. Simulation is both safer and faster. The evolution of the capacity to simulate seems to have accumulated in subjective consciousness. And, you know, I'm a Christian and uh, I don't shy away from the truth. All truth is God's truth. Um, to me, I think that that phrases it really well. Um, believe it or not, in Genesis 2, in the creation account, it describes man being distinct, man being set apart, uh, and sort of having dominion over the animals. I believe that our ability to reason is literally on that level of, of distinct, at this sort of other than level. Um, but we could, we could talk about that another day, but I want to talk about this ability to reason in every decision that we make. And it was famously said that there is a, is a pause between stimulus and reaction. So there's that knee-jerk reaction. There's actually a pause when we make decisions. If someone yells at you, you know, you receive that yelling, you know, might fluster you immediately, but you get a pause, you get an amount of time to react, to respond. And it's that time, that pause, that I want to really emphasize today whenever we go and we make uh, these decisions. Now with life decisions, with bigger ones, uh, you often have more time. You know, you have a, often have a longer pause. Um, so for example, if you're considering who you're getting married to or where you're going to college, uh, you're going to have a much greater time, uh, or career is a big one too, uh, you're going to have a much greater time to make that sort of decision. Um, so, uh, to kick off the conversation, uh, I want to talk about um, just one, uh, one thing, and it's sort of how to calculate opportunities. And there's a misconception here, um, you know, and, and it's going to be seen in this silly example that I'm going to offer you guys right now. So, let's say I'm a sales rep. I'm a young, hotshot sales rep that wants to do really well, in fact. And I'm looking at two accounts on, on who to sell to. And so you have one account, let's just say uh, it's worth 5,000 bucks, and you have another account, let's say, that's worth 10,000 bucks, all right? Obviously, your first instinct, and mine would be two, is to go for this one right here, because $10,000 is more than $5,000. So there's, there is a probability, though, that we need to consider when making this calculation, and it's you need to take the time to consider what's the probability that I'm going to make this sale versus that sale. If you're looking for a job and you know one salary is higher than another, but the salary that's higher is with a startup company, you know it's probable that you're going to lose your job in the near future, and so you really need to evaluate the risk in anything that you do in life. So let's just arbitrarily assign this to having a 20% chance of you landing this sale right here. And let's give this one a 60% chance of you landing this sale. Now, when you do the math on this, you're going to get 0.6, 60% times the 5,000. And on this one, you're going to get only 0.2 times the 10,000. So when you actually do the math, you're looking at 3,000 here, and you're looking at only 2,000 here. Now, of course, the numbers that you assign for this percentage of you actually gaining it are obviously going to be a little inconsistent. You're not going to hit the nail on the head, especially not every time. But as you can see, what appeared like the better uh, avenue to go down would be this $10,000 sale, when the reality is, is that given the probability, this was actually the better option to go for. Now, again, there needs to be lots and lots and lots of room for error here. And I, and I totally understand that. And even if you were able to uh, get a pinpoint accurate probability of each of the sales. You know, sometimes 
you roll a six. When you have a one in six shot, you do the one that has a lesser probability and you end up doing the one with the lesser probability. Um, there's a man, a mathematician in the 1940s or 50s. Um, he, was, he was somewhat famous. He, he actually had a pretty big influence. And, and he famously came up with this, um, you know, and his name is Emil Borel, by the way. You may have heard of him. Um, and basically, it, it does something like this. So as time moves forward, you're going to get more and more a, a, a more and more accurate uh, decision in regards to probability. And there was a, a man, a prisoner actually, who flipped a coin ten thousand times, and uh, and I, I'm sure that what ended up happening was something like this. You know, in the beginning there were some swings, you know, some bigger ones, and then. Eventually, and by the way, this is heads and this is tails, if that wasn't obvious, sorry about that, where at the beginning you're going to have these bigger jumps. But what my point is here, and so was Emil Borles, was that eventually time will find you out. So as long as you're making these probability sort of calculations with anything that you do in life, time is eventually going to hug that reality line. Does that make sense? It's going to eventually uh, guide you to that best decision possible. So here is a, a bit of a you know, practical application uh, for you. And I'm going to start it off with an audacious claim. I think that the average American can and should retire a millionaire. It's, uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm way oversimplifying it, and you'll see why. Uh, and I'm going to talk about actually as my third point as to why it's not exactly a reality. But I'm 20 years old. As I stated before, I'm in college. Um, my tuition is a little bit more expensive, um, you know, but let's just take the tuition of college. Um, I'm assuming pretty much everyone watching this video, hopefully at one point or another, would be able to save up 50,000 bucks. So for, for a normal person's college education, you know, saying that the average American goes to college, we're looking at 50k, okay? So when we're working with $50,000, how do we retire as a millionaire? See, the beauty, and if you're around my age, the beauty is that if you want to retire a millionaire and you have age or, or years on your side, um, you know, this exponential growth is a beautiful thing. And so I'm going to actually introduce you to what is called the rule of 72. And what the rule of 72 says is that whatever percentage your money is growing at, and you're probably hopefully familiar with this, if not, this is great for you to know. Whatever percentage your money is growing at, so you have it in some mutual fund, and it's making 9% every year, how many years will it take to double? Okay? So let's just do this real quick. So it's the rule of 72, so I'm going to just write out a big uh, 72. And so let's say, as before, my money is growing at 9%. So we're going to put that over 9. So it is going to double, my money will double every 8 years. Okay? So if I'm 20 years old right now, and I want to retire when I'm 68, that leaves me with 48 years to let my money grow. So 48 divided by 8 is 6. So my money is going to get the opportunity to double six times, okay? So we're starting with this $50,000 value, so we get to do one, two, three, four, five, six times. 50,000 doubled, 100. Double it again, 200,000. Double it again, 400,000. Double it again, 800,000. You see where I'm going with this pretty quickly, uh-oh, 1.6 mil, and finally we conclude with $3.2 million. Okay, now, obviously it's not that simple. Obviously you don't just stumble upon $50,000 to work with. Obviously life throws curveballs at you. 
You know, this is before you retire. You're going to have kids of your own, hopefully, that you're going to want to reach into that pot and pay for their college tuition. And that's going to obviously mess with our numbers. You're not going to necessarily make 9% every single year. In, in a bull market, you're going to be doing awesome. In a recession, you might need to pull out that money from a mutual fund because you're picking amongst losers. And the best loser of them is letting your money just sit as ca at cash value, suffering from inflation at 2% or whatever that is. But I hope that this makes sense that it is sort of sheerly a, a, a numbers game. If you do it right, numbers will in fact you know, yield this result. Now here is the most interesting one of them all. And this is what I sort of conclude with, is how numbers break down with entities, with people. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. This was actually, um, uh, gained popularity from one of my favorite philosophers. His name is Ravi Zacharias. And, uh, and you know, he, he just drove his point, point home so well. And he starts it out with this example. He says, let's consider a mother who births four children, four boys, for example. You know, so her first child she has and she loves that child with all of her heart. She bears, she bears a, 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 a second child, and a third, and a fourth. Does she all of a sudden have four individual hearts that she loves each one wholeheartedly with? Uh, does she have four times love? Does she love each boy with one-fourth of her heart or one-fourth of her love? As you can see, no. The reality is she loves each boy with all of her heart. And, you know... Numbers was one I'm saying sort of breaks down. Let's look at another example. Different, different woman, she has one son, and she has a husband. And she claims that she derives all of her happiness from her husband equally with her son. Okay, those are the two things giving her happiness. If her son, and, and pardon my vulgarity here, is killed by a drunk driver, do you think that the next day that that woman is all of a sudden going to be running on half happiness? No, her entire world will be shattered. She will be crushed. She will be beside herself. She won't know what to do with her life. There's no, I was at running at 100% happiness because I had both my husband and my son and then all of a sudden it got whacked down to half because I only, I lost one of the two uh, figures giving me uh, you know happiness basically. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, maybe some of you guys don't believe that we have a soul. I mean, the list goes on, you know, one soul plus one soul, man and woman have sex. One plus one usually equals two. Well, one plus one equals one. And the list goes on. So what I'm saying is I understand that, that this silly example is not necessarily a reality. Numbers break down with people, uh, and it always will. But I want to urge each and every one of you, please Take a calculator to every opportunity or every decision that you possibly can because it eventually will find you out. It will eventually help you. So that's sort of all I got for you guys today. Hope you guys uh, were blessed by that. Got some good, you know, quick, easy, spoon-fed material. Uh, but that's all I got. Thanks so much for watching and God bless.